From cuts to broken bones, these actors took the notion of blood, sweat, and tears a little too literally for their craft. Scarface changed Al Pacino's career in more ways than one. The role of Tony Montana seemed to permanently alter his acting moving forward, and the film was a surprise critical disaster after Pacino had starred in pretty much nothing but winners throughout the 70s. The tide eventually turned on Scarface, and it was re-evaluated as a classic. But the experience had already done permanent damage to Pacino both internally and externally. With his character frequently snorting cocaine throughout the film, Pacino ended up doing lasting harm to his nasal passages. He wasn't snorting real cocaine on set, of course, but the powdery stand-in substance still did damage, since snorting large quantities of pretty much any powder is harmful to one degree or another. This wasn't the only injury he sustained while making Scarface. During the big final shootout, Pacino severely burned his hand on the barrel of the prop gun he called his little friend. The burn was so bad that his hand became temporarily fused to the gun, and he was unable to work for weeks afterward. Before shooting even started, Pacino had already been injured in pre-production. Co-star Michelle Pfeiffer went wild, throwing and smashing dishes as part of her audition, which led to a bloody gash on Pacino's hand. Long before the animated Chris Pratt-led The Super Mario Bros. movie took the world and the box office by storm, the first attempt to bring the iconic video game character to the big screen arrived all the way back in 1993. Super Mario Bros. starred Bob Hoskins and John Leguizamo as the plumber duo. Rather than taking a straightforward approach to adapting the colorful platformer, the movie instead converted the characters and setting into a gritty dystopian action movie with little logic, consistency, or care paid to the source material. With the bizarre adaptation choices came a multitude of dangerous stunts, which led to Hoskins sustaining a wild number of injuries. Hoskins agreed to do his own stunts early on, much to his detriment. Co-directors Annabelle Jankel and Rocky Morton really put him through the ringer during the chaotic shoot. Hoskins explained the scope of his injuries to Entertainment Tonight. I got stabbed four times, electrocuted, um, broke a finger, um, nearly got drowned. The broken finger was co-star John Leguizamo's doing. While drunk on set, Leguizamo crushed Hoskins' finger with the sliding door of a van. How could that possibly happen? Anything's possible, Mario. You just gotta believe. Leguizamo said he felt terrible for Hoskins throughout the shoot every time he had his stunt double take his place while Hoskins stayed and got injured. He even considered faking his own injury in solidarity with Hoskins, but didn't follow through. After starting out as a child star, Shia LaBeouf gained a reputation as a method actor who frequently takes things way too far in adulthood. Before LaBeouf got his entire chest tattooed for real for David Ayer's The Tax Collector, he had already gone even further for the director's 2014 film Fury. For his role as a World War II tank gunner, LaBeouf took extreme measures to violently alter his physical appearance in real life rather than using makeup or special effects. The biggest alteration he insisted on was having a tooth pulled from his mouth. After all of the dentists he visited in LA refused to yank a healthy tooth, he instead had the tooth pulled by a random guy he met in a parking lot. Just like the missing tooth, the wounds on his face in the film were also 100% real. LaBeouf cut his face with a knife right in front of co-star Logan Lerman and continuously reopened the wounds throughout the shoot to create real scars. Aya did not instruct LaBeouf to take these extreme measures, but he was appreciative of the lengths LaBeouf went to for the film. Aya said of LaBeouf, he is one of the best actors I've worked with, and he's the most committed to body and soul. The modern era of the long-running Mission Impossible franchise has become synonymous with star Tom Cruise, pushing himself to pull off the wildest stunts possible. Cruise has managed to execute all of these huge stunts safely and in spectacular fashion. The one stunt that significantly injured him in the series was actually an extremely simple one by his standards. A leap from one rooftop to another sandwiched in the middle of an extended chase scene in Mission Impossible Fallout left Cruz with a broken ankle that halted production. What are you waiting for? I'm jumping out a window! The take that caused the injury was used in the final edit of the film, and Cruz can even be seen limping away as he finishes the shot. In order to get the film moving again as quickly as possible, Cruz put himself through weeks of intense rehab to get back in fighting shape. Director and co-writer Christopher McQuarrie ended up using Cruz's recovery time to make the finished film even better. He told CinemaBlend, what the ankle did was allow us to figure out the holes in the script that we were still struggling with. And so we didn't rewrite the script to accommodate the ankle, but we finished the script because the ankle gave us the time. Cruz's ankle injury ended up being a blessing in disguise, and didn't slow down the actor's ambitions to keep pushing the envelope with each installment of the series. 
Olivia Jackson is an actor, martial artist, and stunt performer whose career sadly ended after an injury she sustained on the set of Resident Evil The Final Chapter in 2015. Originally brought on board for a fight scene, Jackson was also asked to serve as star Mila Jovovich's stunt double in a high-speed motorcycle sequence. According to a lawsuit filed by the performer, Director Paul W.S. Anderson personally changed the conditions of the stunt moments before shooting without informing Jackson. Anderson reduced the space between the motorcycle and the camera, which was mounted on a crane and meant to raise over Jackson's head as she rode straight at it. The crane did not move out of the way in time, resulting in a near-fatal collision that left Jackson comatose for several days. Her numerous injuries included several lacerations, a torn open cheek, broken ribs, punctured lungs, and partial paralysis. Her left arm was also amputated. She has not worked on another film since. Although the film's producers initially promised to pay Jackson's medical bills and to cover her rehab costs, they reneged and later blamed the incident on her in court. After Jackson's first lawsuit was dismissed in the US, she sued again in South Africa, where the film was shot, and won on the second attempt. For 1995's Mortal Kombat film, it was decided to have the actors do as much of the action themselves as possible, only relying on stun doubles when it was completely unavoidable. This led to many minor injuries amongst the cast members, some of whom had never performed action before. Robin Shu, who starred as Liu Kang, had a background in the Hong Kong action film industry, so he was used to performing his own stunts and fight scenes. However, even Shu was pushed to the point of sustaining a debilitating injury during the shoot. During his fight scene against Reptile, Shu was launched through the air, slammed his back against a narrow pillar, and crashed to the ground. Even though Shu nailed the stunt on the first take, Anderson made him do it over and over again and only stopped when Shu fractured a couple of ribs on the last impact. Shu recounted the injury to The Hollywood Reporter, saying, I did it one time and it was fantastic. And Paul Anderson said, Well, can you do it again? Because he's such a perfectionist. So we did it ten times. But what if all the legends were true? What legends? The original The Evil Dead took a tiny budget and a boatload of creativity and turned it into a beloved horror franchise that remains ongoing to this day. The budgets for the first two films in the series were so dangerously small that many corners needed to be cut in order to get the project finished and out into the world. The shoot was rife with injuries both small and large. Reportedly, The Evil Dead producer Rob Tappert even said something along the lines of how he enjoys it when an actor bleeds, since it means he got value for money. The entire cast was subjected to grueling conditions, but none were harmed more than star Bruce Campbell. Partway through the shoot, Campbell broke his ankle in the middle of a take, and he got absolutely no sympathy from the producer or writer-director Sam Raimi. Campbell told Den of Geek, We had to keep shooting the rest of the night, with Sam and Rob Tappert cornering me in a room, poking my ankle with sticks because they thought it was funny. He's added that he's had to favor that ankle ever since, which always reminds him of the shoot and of Raimi. Given that Apocalypse Now was one of the only movie shoots plagued by enough production troubles to warrant an entire documentary, it should come as no surprise that there were lasting injuries on set. Multiple wounds were incurred by the film's star, Martin Sheen, and one happened right in the opening scene. Audiences are introduced to Captain Willard while he is in the middle of a drunken freakout in a hotel room. The scene was filmed on Sheen's 36th birthday, while he was trashed for real and also working out some internal issues. Every time I think I'm gonna wake up back in the jungle. One of Sheen's improvised impulses was to demonstrate Willard's lethal hand to hand combat skills by punching a real mirror that happened to be in the room, which broke and cut open his hand. The blood in the scene was all real, and Sheen insisted to director Francis Ford Coppola that they keep shooting, instead of breaking to get him the necessary medical treatment. He still has the scar on his hand to this day. As serious as the hand wound was, it was eclipsed by Sheen's near-fatal heart attack that arrived later on during production. Best known these days for her role on Stranger Things, Winona Ryder got a start in the 80s in films that would go on to become classics like Heathers and Beetlejuice. In 2002, Ryder paired it with Adam Sandler for Mr. Deeds. The movie stuck Ryder with not just her worst on-set injury, but also the worst injury of her life. She told W Magazine, I never broke a bone until the movie, until I did Deeds. While filming the sequence where she and Sandler ride bikes down the Central Park staircase, Ryder got her heel caught in the bike pedal, which led to a crash down the steps. She describes continuing to shoot that night and not realizing how much pain her arm was in until she woke up the next morning. She recalled, Well, I'm an actress. I'm trained to hide my pain. But eventually I went to the doctor and it was broken in three places. 
She considered it lucky that the breaks happened on a joint, which meant that her arm wasn't placed in a cast, and filming could continue as normal without needing to hide the injury on camera. In a terrible bit of bad luck, Ryder rebroke the same arm later that year, when a news camera rammed into her as she was swarmed by the press on her way into a courthouse for a hearing related to her shoplifting arrest. Years ago, the sets of Hong Kong martial arts movies were known as dangerous places to work, with the stars routinely doing their own stunts and large portions of films even improvised on the spot. One such film was 1992's Once Upon a Time in China 2, in which Donnie Yen played the film's main villain opposite Jet Li. The big final fight between Yen and Li is the film's highlight, but came at the cost of Yen sustaining a serious injury. Yen told GQ, The way we worked in Hong Kong for many, many, many years is that we change the choreography as we go along. Freestyle, basically, it's like a rapping contest. As Yen and Lee changed up the fight choreography, they kept challenging each other to be faster until Lee eventually slipped up after doing dozens of takes and whacked Yen in the eyebrow with a very real, very heavy bamboo pole. Yen was millimeters away from being blinded, but got away with a scar. When Yen and Lee fought each other on screen again a decade later in Hero, a similar slip-up happened. Lee caught Yen on the opposite side of the face with his pointy prop sword, nearly blinding him in his other eye. Like the first injury, this one required half a dozen stitches. He whacked me on one side, and ten years later, he whacked me on the other side. Back in the early days of cinema, the stars of silent comedies were already pushing the envelope in terms of the stunts they pulled off on camera. Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton are the two most famous names of this type during that era. But Harold Lloyd comes in at a close third. He was most famous for his daring clock tower stunt from Safety Last, which later inspired Jackie Chan's death-defying clock tower drop in Project A. As impressive as Lloyd's clock stunt already is, it becomes even more astounding when you learn that he pulled off this feat while wearing a prosthetic after losing part of his hand. The injury actually occurred while Lloyd was promoting his collection of silent comedy shorts back in 1919. For some reason that has never been properly explained, a real bomb was present on set, and Lloyd played around with it during a photo shoot under the assumption that it was a prop. He realized it was real moments too late and lost part of his right hand in the blast. His face was also damaged and he lost his ability to see temporarily, but his sight luckily returned. Lloyd kept making movies for many years while disguising his injury with various gloves and prosthetics, which undoubtedly made each of his stunts more challenging. As one of the world's top martial arts stars, Michelle Yeoh has sustained a multitude of injuries throughout her prolific career. She had already been the star of over a dozen Hong Kong action films by the time she appeared in 1996's The Stunt Woman and incurred the worst injury of her career. Yeo described the unsafe conditions of the Hong Kong action film industry to The Independent, saying, Back then, the fights were insane. No CGI. It was dangerous and risky. It's not fun. The Stunt Woman lived up to its title by showcasing Yeo pulling off multiple death-defying stunts, but one went wrong. The fateful stunt required Yo to leap from an overpass onto the top of a truck as it drove far beneath her. Yo nailed the first take, but was required to do it again from a different angle. On the second attempt, Yo fell face first and landed with her head caught between the mattresses that were meant to cushion her fall, causing the rest of her body to flip over and hyperextend backwards. The fall saddled her with multiple broken ribs and a fractured vertebrae in her spine, requiring her to be immobilized in a back and neck brace for an extended period of time. While hospitalized and unable to move, Yo nearly gave up her career in favor of a safer life. Oddly enough, it was Quentin Tarantino of all people who visited Yo in the hospital and inspired her to keep acting. Taylor Hickson made international headlines after filing a lawsuit against the producers of the horror film Incident in a Ghostland. While filming a shot that required her to press her face against the glass window of a door while pounding on it, the glass broke and sliced her face and neck. Hickson told Deadline, the craft service lady held my face together with napkins in her hands. She went through so many napkins, there was so much blood. The injury required 70 stitches and multiple medical procedures, but she was left permanently disfigured. Hickson played a supporting role in the film, and the incident occurred on her last day on set. The film was directed by Pascal Lozier, best known for his work in the new French extremity movement. While filming the shot, Lozier kept telling Hickson to hit the glass harder and harder until it eventually shattered. Hickson actually stopped the shoot at one point to ask the director and producers if it was safe to keep hitting the door harder, and they assured her that it was. The Winnipeg-based production company behind the film was fined $40,000 after it pleaded guilty to charges that it did not do everything possible to guarantee Hickson's safety. The Sessions is based on the true story of Mark O'Brien, a man who depends on an iron lung to survive, but wants to lose his virginity via a sex surrogate. 
Since John Hawkes was playing a real person, he wanted his performance to be as authentic as possible, and that meant embodying the role physically. The real Mark was unable to move from the neck down and suffered from a severely distorted spine. To force a similar result out of his own anatomy, Hawkes took to lying on top of a weirdly shaped piece of foam. What was at first mildly uncomfortable began to do permanent damage to Hawkes' body after weeks of production, with him lying motionless in the contorted position for hours every day. Hawkes took measures to try to counteract the lasting effect, such as doing yoga on set. But his doctor eventually told him that his internal organs had begun to migrate and that the damage to his spine could likely never be fully undone. Hawkes told Vulture, My spine doesn't have enough movement in one direction, and the opposite direction has way too much movement. Legendary martial artist Sammo Hung has been injured countless times throughout his lengthy tenure as a Hong Kong action star. While he was able to power through the pain for the bulk of his career, Hung's numerous injuries eventually caught up to him as he aged. In 2017, he wound up being remanded into a wheelchair by his doctor. He would remain wheelchair-bound for the next two years until walking with the aid of a cane in 2019, and finally being able to walk on his own in time to receive a Lifetime Achievement Award. One of Hung's most physically demanding films was Ip Man 2, which pushed him to his limits as he neared his 60s. In the middle of the intense shoot, Hung required heart surgery. Compounding his delicate state after the surgery, Hung was punched for real in his fight scene against the Twister, which opened a gash on his face that required four stitches. Proving his mettle, Hung spent an additional five hours filming with the open gash in his face before seeking medical treatment. Hung's most prominent wound is the deep, curved scar around his nose and upper lip that can be seen in almost all of his films. However, this did not happen on a film set. While defending a friend in a brawl with real-life gangsters, Hung was stabbed in the face with a broken bottle, leaving him with a distinctive scar for the rest of his life. After breaking through to English-speaking audiences with his villainous role in Casino Royale, Mass Mikkelsen has spent the rest of his career bouncing back and forth between English and Danish productions. One film that bridged the gap between the two was 2014's The Salvation, a Danish spin on the American Western. Mikkelsen stars as the man who gets caught up in a violent revenge plot after his wife and son are murdered. The injury Mikkelsen sustained on set was his own doing and didn't even occur for the sake of a shot. While falling around on set with a heavy knife he bought locally, Mikkelsen dropped it and nearly sliced his finger clean off. Since he couldn't wear a bandage on camera, the deep wound was left open while they continued shooting. The film is set in the American West but was filmed out on the plains of South Africa, and the remote location made getting proper medical treatment a bit of a challenge. Shooting outdoors in the dirt and dust quickly led to Mickelson's wounds getting infected. Local doctors were ready to amputate his finger, but Mickelson convinced them to hold off. Luckily, after a couple of days of him taking antibiotics, the infection went away, leaving the actor with just a deep gash to worry about. Your hands start doing strange, strange things. John Rhys Davies is best known for playing Gimli the Dwarf in the Lord of the Rings series. One of his first roles after that trilogy was the Hallmark TV movie La Femme Musketeer. As the title implies, the project is a sequel to the classic The Three Musketeers. But instead of following the original characters, it follows the next generation of Musketeers. Rhys Davies plays Porthos, one of the original Musketeers. The actor was injured during the shoot and ended up suing the producers before La Femme Musketeer was released. While filming, a constructed set wall collapsed on top of him which he blamed on the negligence of the producers. In the lawsuit, he describes his injuries as severe and permanent. The project was filmed in Croatia, and Rhys Davies was rushed to a local emergency room where he was treated for a fractured arm and a bloody head injury. Paz de la Huerta has been in acclaimed films like The Cider House Rules and Enter the Void when Nurse came along and derailed her career. While filming a simple shot of her crossing the street, de la Huerta was struck by a stunt ambulance when the driver turned sharply and collided with her. In the collision and a subsequent fall to the street, de la Huerta broke her tailbone and fractured her spine. The injuries required over 20 different surgeries and led to her receiving $73,000 in workers' compensation. Not ready to settle for just a 73k, De La Huerta sued the production company, Lionsgate, for the massive sum of $55 million. The lawsuit was partially about the major injuries she sustained, but also about the impact the whole ordeal had on her life afterward. She said that the film completely destroyed her career and left her with lasting physical and emotional trauma. She also took issue with the filmmaker's decision to dub over her voice with a different actor for portions of the film without her consent. De La Huerta was unsuccessful in the lawsuit, and her case was eventually dismissed. 
H.B. Halicki wrote, directed, and starred in the original Gone in 60 Seconds, but the film's messy plot is just an excuse for a car chase that lasts for over 40 straight minutes. Halicki did all of the stunt driving himself without acquiring permits, shutting down roads, or even informing the public. With unsuspecting cars and pedestrians all around and without much of a plan, the chase sequence was full of very real danger and on-the-spot improvisation. Halicki's first major injury in the chase scene came when he was rear-ended on the highway while going 90 miles per hour by a random car, whose driver had no idea they were part of a movie chase scene. Halicki's car was sent spinning into a lamppost, injuring him and almost totaling the car. The crash was incorporated into the story. He just hit a damn post. His worst injury arrived in the film's big climactic stunt. Halicki jumped his car 130 feet and crashed it nose first straight into the road with no padding or anything to soften the blow. He was left with a compressed spine from the force of the impact that permanently altered the way he walked. Fifteen years later, Halicki died while filming the sequel. A stunt involving a collapsing water tower went wrong when a support cable snapped and knocked a telephone pole onto him.